Yes, you can say it, we are proud, resentful and have a boulder of chip on our shoulder. It is also a representation of the proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union. That's a tempting thought experiment and I think the relationship between China and the US would have been a lot more flirtatious. A question that I got asked the most when I was living in England was how do you feel about China's CCP? And as a citizen, how could you put up with a dictatorship and not want to do anything about it? I always felt tongue-tied at the question because I could totally see where people came from. The process of democratization. With China's leaders about our deep concerns over religious freedom and human rights. The progress of those countries in the former Soviet bloc that embraced democracy stand in clear contrast to those that did not. On an intuitive level, I just knew China was different. But at the time, I couldn't put that in words other than telling people, well, I really wish you get to know China a little bit better. And that is why in this video, I take it upon myself to explain why China's one-party authoritarian rule gained so much consensus among Chinese people. And more importantly, why China seems so resistant to the criticisms from the West when it comes to its political system. Before I do that, I just want to first point out the value and the thought tradition in the West because that is really important to understand China and why we have such a big difference. Stay with me here, it will get more interesting. For those of you who live in a Western democratic society, people tend to have a more independent and autonomous understanding of a person. People are born with natural rights and they have all the freedom to pursue what they want to do, given that they don't harm the interests of other people. If we dig a little bit further, this thought tradition can date back all the way to people like Hobbes. As he famously argued in Leviathan, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. Government exists out of consent from people who voluntarily give up their rights so that the government can protect their long-term interests. And so politics is about administering justice and securing human rights. The West's concern with the legitimacy of government is furthered by liberal thinkers like Locke and social contract theories like Rousseau and Tocqueville. These people provide a plethora of intellectual foundation to make sure that the state does not have absolute state power. And that is why in the UK, neither the parliament nor the judiciary nor the monarchy has absolute monopoly over political authority. And in America's constitution, the Bill of Rights, it protects civil liberties like freedom of speech, human rights, private properties, and limit arbitrary state power. Okay, here's the thing. In China, our political tradition and system remained pretty much the same until 1911 when Qing Dynasty fell apart. And that was only because Chinese people finally realized the Qing government could not defend China from foreign invasion. For thousands of years, Chinese people had been living under an imperial system and an all-encompassing school of thought called Confucianism. Back in the olden days, Confucianism is kind of like Christianity. But nowadays in China, it is still permeating into every inch of the Chinese society, including politics. Unlike Hobbes and Locke, Confucius taught us to think of ourselves in relation to something else, our family, our society, our community, and our country. We have a moral code called filial piety. Under this ethical code, children are supposed to be obedient to their parents wives to their husbands, and people to their rulers. People higher up in the hierarchy are considered as a benign authority, which means that they are meant to take care of their subjects in terms of their well-being and happiness. So that's why when it comes to the ruler of the state, just as a father was expected to make decisions on behalf of his family, so too was the ruler expected to make decisions on behalf of his people. The ideal government for Confucius was government for the people, not of or by the people. Naturally, the legitimacy of the government falls upon its ability to take care of its people. It includes things like economy, safety and livelihood. If you look at the word country in the Chinese language, which consists of two characters, guo and jia, guo means state and jia means family. First, we have the state and then we have families. Without the state, families cannot survive. 
And that is why, culturally speaking, Chinese people are so used to the idea of knowing your places instead of demanding equal political participation. In a word, we don't have the tradition of citizen participation and democratic ideals. And that predisposes us to accept a strong authoritarian government that uses tradition to bolster its rule. Okay, I know now you might be asking, but what about Taiwan? Taiwan is both Confucius and democratic, so they aren't necessarily incompatible, right? The second piece of the puzzle is found in the 20th century mainland China. No people, no nation has been so cruelly severed and shattered. China is a land exhausted by battle. Misery and hunger are everywhere. And there's something really important to know. After the collapse of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, the time we called the century of humiliation, China's top priority has always been state building and fighting off the imperialist powers. China at the time was still marred by territorial invasion from foreign powers, burdened from all kinds of indemnities, from the loss of war, civil strife among the warlords, and a raging inflation. The Chinese dollar soars from a rate of 2,000 to 1 American dollar in 1946, eventually reaching 300,000, then 6 million to 1. On top of that, China did not have a political system to protect its people and reunite the country. We tried the Republic of China in 1912. We also tried constitutional monarchy in 1916. Both of these did not work. Finally, we have two political parties with a bit of power and some vision to rebuild China the Kuomintang, the GMD, and the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Both parties favoured an authoritarian one-party government during the war, but for the GMD, Kuomintang, its goal is to use the authoritarian government to rebuild the country and reunite people before it transitioned into a liberal democracy. For the CCP, its goal is to eliminate class struggle and create an egalitarian, classless Chinese society. Both parties didn't like each other and didn't really put their heart into building a coalition government. So they ended up going into a civil war after Japan was defeated. Civil war spreads throughout the country. The GMD lost the war and fled to Taiwan. Okay, this is the trajectory of China's politics. China fell into the hands of the CCP who founded People's Republic of China in 1949. At this point, you can safely assume that the direction China took had everything to do with the vision of the CCP. The party's leader, Mao Zedong, at this point was pretty much done with using democracy to save China. And in his famous piece on the People's Democratic Dictatorship, you can see this attitude. From the time of China's defeat in the Opium War of 8040, Chinese progressives went through untold hardships in their quest for truth from the Western countries. In my youth, I too engaged in such studies. For quite a long time, those who acquired the new learning felt confident that it would save China. But imperialist aggression shattered the fond dreams of the Chinese about learning from the West. It was very odd. Why were the teachers always committing aggression against their pupils? For him, the only path to restore China's greatness was to follow the path of the Soviet Union. Mao comes for help to his old Soviet comrades. He is a classic Marxist. He wants Soviet money. Soviet machines, Soviet technicians. A 30-year friendship treaty is signed. China gets a $300 million loan. Later will come machinery and advisors. Through revolutions to create a classless society and eradicate all the imperialist powers inside China. They portray Uncle Sam as their arch enemy. There are appeals to their pride, their nationalism, their hatred. In China's early state building, it basically copied the system of the Soviet Union, including its constitution, one-party dictatorship, the Leninist centralism to ensure the CCP control, and the land reform to abolish the private property. The rest is history. China is the way it is, not only because it has an intellectual foundation, but also it is a result of wars, trauma, self-determination, and international influence. 
It is also a representation of the proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union. I know at this point you might want to argue with me and say, well, all of that doesn't quite excuse the fact that China has suffered so many catastrophes under the CCP government, things like the Great Famine and the Cultural Revolution. You know, things like that would never happen in a democratic country because we have process, we have system, we have accountability. That is a solid point, and I won't even defend it, we have a very flawed system. But we are only looking at how China came about and why it is still existing and how it makes sense to its people. Which lends on to my last point, you know, the reason why China seems so resistant to the criticisms from the West when it comes to its policies in foreign affairs, politics and economy is because Chinese people share a very, very nationalist narrative towards the past. Remember the term 100 years of humiliation I talked about when I mentioned the Chinese history, you know, the time when China was invaded by foreign powers and was suffering from war. That is a big, big part of our collective memory and how we remembered our solidarity. It kind of goes something like this. China as the Zhongguo, the Middle Kingdom, had once fallen from grace. And we Chinese people had struggled through the war. Finally, we achieved independence and supercharged our economy. That kind of made us entitled to having our own values and systems and ways of doing things. It's the interplay of culture, of history and national grievances that make up the consciousness of the Chinese people today. And yes, you can say it, we are proud, resentful and have a boulder of chip on our shoulder. Are we biased? Yes. Is this emotional? Yes. Is this ever going to change? I know some of you still have doubts and you might be thinking, well, I wish the Kuomintang won the war, then China would have been a lot different. That's a tempting thought experiment and I think the relationship between China and the US would have been a lot more flirtatious. But you know history has happened and China is indeed a very lonely country. I hope at this very end you've got to learn a little bit more about China and think about the country a little bit differently. That is a short version of the making of the China today and I hope it answered the question I posted earlier in the video. With the intellectual foundation of Confucius that predisposes Chinese people to accept a strong authoritarian government and with the coincidence of history that made China fall into the leadership of the CCP and a collective memory that consolidated Chinese memory of the past and nation building. All of these things added up together makes up the consciousness, the mind and the structure of the China today. Finally, I'm curious what you think of this video. Write me a comment and let me know what you think and what you would like me to cover in the future. And if you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you could do the algorithm stuff by liking the video or sharing it with someone you think might benefit from this. But either way, if you're watching to this far, thank you so much for staying. I appreciate you. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.